there are some sermons that no preacher likes to preach unless he's got a bad attitude himself. And this is one of those that I don't like to preach because we are people who like to hear the good side. And we like to uh, be able to, uh, how should I say, you know, see God from his perspective of love and appreciation. But as I was uh, talking with Dave and Neil before the services, I made the comment that I made here before. And that is that you cannot understand, for example, the gospel of Jesus Christ unless you look at it in perspective or in relationship to the fall of man, the depravity of man. And uh, of course, uh, I believe very strongly that if you want to really understand what the gospel is all about, one of the first things you need to do is you need to go back and read the book of Genesis, and especially the first eight chapters, uh, because this is, this is what shall, tells us or what shows us why uh, the gospel is needed. Why does man need to be reborn? Why does he need to be brought back to a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ? Uh, have you ever noticed that when a, you go into a jewelry store, if you want to look at diamonds, uh, when the jeweler brings those diamonds out for you to look at, what does he put them on? He puts them on a piece of dark velvet, usually black or very dark blue. Why? So the contrast is obvious. If you were to put those diamonds up against a white background, for example, they wouldn't look nearly as beautiful and would not be nearly as appealing as they are when you look against them at them in the perspective of the black. And so this is a lot of what Paul is trying to help us to understand. And if you remember last week, we talked about this idea of the power of the gospel. And uh, in Romans 1.16, which is one of the most powerful verses of Scripture in the book of Romans, you find Paul making this comment. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he defines it, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And the big emphasis that I tried to make last week that I just keep harping on especially with some of my preacher friends <clears throat> is that my sermons for example are not the gospel they are words presentations about the gospel the little four spiritual law booklet is not the gospel it is a booklet put together about the gospel to describe what the gospel is and the gospel is very simple God's supernatural power invading your life like a spear in a life-changing way that changes you from what you used to be to what you can become. That's the gospel. The gospel is God is not satisfied for you to live in your sin. He's not satisfied for you to live separated and isolated from Him. He's not satisfied for you to face the future in a way that means ultimately you will be eternally separated from Him. He's not satisfied that you are the one who will have to pay the consequences and pay the price for your sin. And so as you move into the second, in the latter part of the first chapter of Romans, and then into chapter 2, we find that we deal with the aspect or the opposite of God's love, and that is God's wrath, God's anger, His indignation, not toward you and me, but toward the sin and toward the circumstances that led to our alienation from Him, you see. And so this is what we're going to look at today. The gospel is the dynamic release of God's life-changing power into a human heart. Now the note sheet, as always, has a lot more material on it than I'm going to cover. That's by design, so that you can take it home. You can use it for your own personal Bible study if you wish. You also can use it if you want to, to share with other people. If you lead a Bible study group, you may find that some of the stuff that I share with you, you want to pass on to another group, and you're, you know, you're welcome to do that. But today we're going to be looking at this passage of Scripture that Dave read already, 
uh, beginning Romans 1.18 and going through the fourth verse of the second chapter. But in doing that, I want us also to go back to a very familiar passage of Scripture in the Gospel of John. Because in this passage of Scripture, Jesus himself talks about the wrath of God. And in John 3, verse 16, through verse 18, verse 16, of course, is the most familiar passage of Scripture in the world, I think, in the entire Bible. And he basically says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only beloved son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But the, the story doesn't end there. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world or condemn it, but that the world might be saved through him. Then he goes on and describes this and explains this to Nicodemus. And then in verse 36, he concludes by saying this, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but instead the wrath of God abides on him. Now that is a tough statement. We like the first part that says if you believe in him, you'll have eternal life. But we don't like to talk to people, and we don't even like to admit it in our own lives, that if we don't believe in Him, God's wrath abides on us. The word abide basically means it rests upon us. It is the burden, it is the load that we carry if we reject God's offer of redemption and reconciliation. So today... We're going to touch on just a few of the things that are on the note sheet. And the first thing we want to do is to look at verses 20, uh, uh, 20 through 23 to see what this depravity really looks like that uh, Paul is talking about, this depravity of man that is causing God's wrath to be poured out on mankind. And this is so amazing to me, isn't it? that you can take a God who loves the world so unconditionally and so intensely, and yet out of that love and compassion, there's a willingness on his part to pour out his wrath and judgment upon those who reject his love. God, when God is requited by someone, there is no alternative left except for him to pour out his wrath. Now you may say, well, that's not fair. The word fair is not an issue that is dealt with in the Bible. What is dealt with is that is the issue of justice and truth. That's what drives the Bible from beginning to end. And so for those people who come along and say, well, I thought God was a God of love. I thought he was a God of compassion. I thought, you know, that, and, you know, he, can I just tell you this? If you haven't found it out yet, God is a God who's not a grandfather. He's not a doting grandfather that lets you get away with just about anything you want to. Of course, you didn't know my grandfather. My grandfather was worse on me than my father was at times. And he never let me get away with anything. But a lot of people think that's the way God is. Other people think that God is like a bellhop. J.D. Phillips, who it was the one who did the Phillips translation of the New Testament. J.B. Phillips wrote a book many years ago in the 1950s, and the title of it was, Your God is Too Small. And he uses the different analogies that people have, like a grandfather or a bellhop who comes and whenever you have a burden to carry or a suitcase that needs to go upstairs, he grabs it and takes it up there for you. That's not the kind of God that we're looking at, at here today. God that we're looking at is a God who is absolutely sovereign in every area. And He is a God of righteousness, a God of just a judgment, and a God of justice, but also a God of love and compassion. How He is able to balance the two between His love and His wrath, I don't have a clue, except to know that He is God. And that as God, He is perfect in every way. So what we see today in this passage of Scripture, if you look at, first of all, in verses 18 through 20, you find, first of all, that uh, man, as Dave said, uh, man knows deep inside that God is real. Now, you have the Humanist Manifesto. That was, they started writing the Humanist Manifesto, I think, back in the 1930s, perhaps. 
And it has been written and rewritten over and over and over again. You can find different versions of it. Just go Google Humanist Manifesto and see how many different varieties. But one of the common ingredients through all the different variations of the Human Manifesto was the insistence that man is a secular being and that God is not real and God does not exist. Too bad they're wrong. <laughs> You cannot, listen folks, you cannot historically, archaeologically, or scientifically, or medically, in any other way, prove that statement that God does not exist. I remember years ago, there was a, uh, there was a magazine I used to get, it's no longer a publication now, but uh, on the front page of it, they had a little cartoon, it was a two-pane cartoon, two little, pit, little windows side by side. And on the one of them, this was back in the 1970s when the God is Dead thing was all real, the big uh, order of the day. And you had this little sign that somebody had pegged into the ground, sort of like an election sign, a candidate's election sign. And on that little uh, pane, that little sign, were simply three words, God is dead. And in the next pane, there was a little vine that began to grow up, and then there were three panes. Then in the third pane, the vine had covered the bottom part of the, of the sign, and all it said was, God is. <laughs> That's the ultimate conclusion that any logical-minded person will come to. God is. And as Him, as God being God, He is God, a God of both love and compassion and wrath and justice on the other side. Now, so the first thing that this scripture tells us is the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men that suppress the truth and righteousness. And here's what it says. Because that which is known about God is evident not to them, it is evident within them. So we see, first of all, that the existence of God is evident because it's a part of our spiritual DNA. It's there. You don't have to look for it. This goes back to what, what we preached about last year. Is God, is man religious by nature? And we talked about that, and the answer is yes, he's religious by nature, but religion per se was a substitute that man created in order to satisfy the emptiness that he had in his heart because man was created not for religion, but for a relationship. This is why you never find complete satisfaction in your church, no matter what church you go to. Because it's not a matter of your religious preference or your religious activity, but it's a matter of a personal relationship with God. And that is possible only through the one that came as the Redeemer, as the one to reconcile God and man back to each other. It's the person of Jesus Christ. But Paul is making it very clear. He's saying, look, he said, uh, man knows God's real. You don't have to teach him that. He may deny it. He may try to suppress it. He may try to do everything he possibly can. But the bottom line is man knows that he's real. Then in verse 21, we see that man willfully refuses to recognize God. You see, man doesn't like to acknowledge that there's a God that... Uh, created him, but you know the big issue is man does not like to acknowledge that there's a God to whom he is accountable someday. Have you ever thought what it would be like if man comes along who doesn't believe in God, let's say we saw Carl Sagan here a few weeks ago on this DVD series on Wednesday night, <coughs> and all these different secularists who insist that man does, or that God does not exist, and all of a sudden they discover he does. What does that do to their theology, to their beliefs, to their entire frame of reference for life? It totally destroys it. So rather than face the fact that they're going, there, there are some things in their lives that are going to have to be destroyed and demolished, they would rather just come along and continue to insist God does not exist. But the fact still remains that he does, and deep inside, instinctively, man knows that. Well, what does he do then in order to deal with this conflict between what he really instinctively knows is true and what he tries to make himself believe? 
Well, in verse 21, the last part of it, he resorts to speculations and fantasies. He tries to concoct all kinds of ideas in order to satisfy this conflict between the two of them. And Paul then goes on to say that eventually, when man does this, he gets to the point that he, they, man becomes a fool. Now, it doesn't say, notice in that scripture, it does not say that man becomes foolish. You know, I've been foolish a lot of times, Joanne. But I hope that there's never been a time in my life where I became a fool. Someone said one time that a man thought to be a fool, when he opens his mouth, he, re he, he uh, removes all doubt. So man has to deal with this issue. He's a fool. You've heard people say, well, you know, if, you, if, you, if, you, if that's what you believe, or if you're going to try to climb that mountain in the shape you're in, you're a what? Fool. Another word would be idiot. Another phrase would be, you're a dead man. <laughs> and then, because man has become a fool, the next thing we see in verse 23 is that he creates his own idols. Now, isn't that strange? Because man wants to be secular, he wants to be independent, he wants to claim there is no God, but he ends up creating his own gods to take God the real God's place. It's just a fascinating thing to me that how, how human nature is so messed up. Now, in verses 24 through 32, I find a progressive, a very interesting progressive sequence. You see, there's a lot of times in the Bible that we run into these sequences we don't think so much about them, but there's a progression to it. And so in that passage of Scripture, he says, first of all, a man is driven by lust. What is the word lust? And we think of it more in sexual, uh, sexual matters, but it actually is much more comprehensive. The word lust basically means a craving passion, a craving desire something to be fulfilled. And so here's what we see on the, on the situation is that we are driven by lust, in verse 24, trying to fulfill that emptiness that's inside you, and that leads you then to creating all kinds of, and developing all kinds of perverse thoughts in your mind in order to satisfy those lusts. And as a result of that, you end up with these impure thoughts, and those, those thoughts then, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. And so all of a sudden, you find yourself engaged in some of the types of actions that are described in this last part of the first chapter. Now, we place so much focus on the, the homosexual activity that's described here that we forget sometimes that God also looks e with equal repulsion at the other sins that are listed in that passage of Scripture. When that it deals with things like envy and murder and strife, deceit and malice and so forth and so on, God does not categorize sin, and God is just as just just as repulsed by by slander and lying as He is by homosexuality. Now, you may not agree with that, but we have to understand that sin is sin, no matter its color, no matter its shape, no matter its level. That does not diminish the, the, the wickedness and the evil of the sexual perversion. And let me just tell you that the reason that that type of sin, any kind of sexual sin, whether it's homosexuality or, or, or adultery or any other type, the reason that God places so much emphasis on that particular sin in the Scripture is because it is that kind of intimate relationship that God uses to describe and illustrate his relationship between him and man and, his rela and Christ's relationship to the church. There's that intimacy, that procreative ability. And, and so because of that symbolism, that spiritual symbolism, God makes, goes to great lengths oftentimes in scriptures like this to point that out. Because there is a dimension there that is unlike any other kind of sin. So having gone on with that then, as man engages in these actions, he becomes filled with delusion, and then that, that leads him only to deeper and deeper and deeper depravity, as you see described. So let's look at this idea then of what is the wrath of God itself. So when we talk about the wrath of God, what are we talking about? Well, I listed there two, uh, the, the, the two different words. In the Old Testament, it's in the Hebrew language. And in the New Testament, it's in the Greek language, and they mean almost exactly the same thing. Now, here's the thing that I'm coming, that I'm concluding. For me personally, is I have underestimated the violent nature of God's wrath. 
I have underestimated the intensity and the, 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 the revulsion that God's wrath encompasses. When God it talks about God's wrath, how can I say it? God is really, really ticked off. Now, he's not ticked off at man. He's ticked off at what happened to man and what the consequences are in man's life. And so we see, for example, in the Hebrew word, it means that a rapid breathing, a snorting face, or countenance of passion, passionate, angry indignation with the idea that retribution is coming. Now, the Greek word, which is the word from which we get the word orgy, or gay. The Greek word means almost the same thing. A violent, justified, passionate abhorrence and indignation accompanied by vengeance and punishment. So that's kind of a scary God, isn't it? But it's the God who loves us. And He loves us so much so that He is willing to exercise this kind of wrath and vengeance against all sin, against all ungodliness, and against the one who caused it all in the first place in the fall of the Garden of Eden. Now, I got to thinking about this, and I thought, you know, there are other words in the Bible that are similar, so I went back, in fact, I did some of this early this morning, and I went back and I discovered the, the word fury. Because it also describes God as being a God of fury. And there are verse after verse after verse, 34 different times that I know of, the word fury uh, uh, appears in the Bible. And when I went to look at the definitions, I discovered that the synonym, the synonyms for God's wrath are words like fury, indignation, and anger. So why does God get so angry over this type of issue. It's because of the catastrophe that happened in man's life when he chose to be independent from God in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. Now you can find many, many scriptures, some of which I've listed, that tell us a little bit about God's wrath. For example, we can find that rejecting the Word of God will bring on His wrath. We can also find that blasphemy against God, blaming God for something He didn't do and taking credit for something God did, that will cause, that will release God's wrath. Rejecting, most importantly, rejecting God's Son guarantees His wrath. This is why the scripture I read in John 3, 36, He who believes in Him shall have eternal life, but he who does not believe, he who rejects Him, the wrath of God abides on him. So there are a lot of different scriptures that you can look at and I'll leave that for you to examine on your own. So, what about this righteousness, righteous wrath of God? What is it like? I don't know that I could ever fully explain it. I don't think any human being can. I think the wrath of God is so comprehensive and vast that just as his love is that way, it is impossible for the human heart to grasp the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. But we do know some of these things that I've listed on the back page. We do know that the wrath of God, first of all, the nature of it is it's a divine wrath, not a human type. And that's part of the battle, part of the reason why we can't understand His wrath. All we can do is just look at what the Bible says and just accept it, but to fully understand it. And, and, and so I tried to think about this, you know, how does this work? And, and the only thing I can think of, and it is so completely inadequate to illustrate, but let's say that you're an artist, and you have painted a masterpiece, and it's the most beautiful painting that has ever been, been, been put to the canvas. And while you're standing there and looking at that and just taking great pride in what you did, somebody comes along with a can of paint and just throws that paint all over that painting and then pulls out a knife and begins to slash it and then throws it into a fire and begins to burn it. What's that going to do to you? It's going to 
cause your wrath, your ire, to all of a sudden be erupt, to all of a sudden erupt. Or let's say that you are a potter, and you go to great lengths, as the prophet Jeremiah describes, putting that lump of clay on the wheel. And my mother was a ceramist and a potter, so I understand a little bit about this. And you work diligently to shape that. And then you put it in the kiln and you do all of these different things to make this into one of the most beautiful pieces of pottery ever created. And you set it on the shelf and someone comes along with a ball, baseball bat and smashes it. Now, those are just a couple of human examples to help understand what, what the Creator feels when His creation has been violated and has been destroyed and abused. That's a minuscule example of what the wrath of God is like. Now may I say again, God's wrath is not poured out upon man because he is man. God's wrath is poured out on man because man has, been, has fallen prey to the temptations and the sins that were planted within him by the, by the, the rebellion in, in the Garden of Eden at the hand of Satan. And no one is more hated and reviled by God than the prince of darkness who is a, an angelic being that used to worship God, used to obey God, and used to rule over his creation at God's command. Go back and read in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. It will help us understand because it is that prince of darkness who used to be called the bright and morning star who has become, you know, uh, Manuel Scott was an African-American pastor in San Diego back uh, in the 1970s. And uh, son, his little boy came to him one day and, says, and said, Daddy, does God create everything? And uh, Manuel Scott said, yes, he does, son. And he says, well, did God create the devil? Now, how would you answer your child? Well, he said, Yes, son, he created the devil, but he didn't make the devil a devil. He was Lucifer, the archangel, the one who resided in the throne in the presence of God and carried out God's bidding. He had a sort of a threefold ministry. He could say he was an angelic prophet, priest, and king. In that sense, what does a prophet do? A prophet stands before the people in God's behalf. And this is what Lucifer did. He stood before the angelic world in God's behalf and gave out the directives and the instructions that God wanted the angelic world to carry out in that sphere of life. He has a, as a priest, what does a priest do? A priest stands before God in behalf of the people. So as a prophet, he stood before the people in God's behalf as a priest, he stands before God in the people's behalf, and he makes intercession. He, and that, that's so he represented the angelic world before the Father who created them all. And then he was also had a kingly role because we know from Scripture that he was called the prince of the powers of the air. He was the prince of this world. I believe personally that, that the battle that went on between God and Satan took place here on earth. Now, that's just my personal opinion. I won't take time to go into that any further. But the point is very simple. The wrath of God is poured out against all ungodliness, and it is a divine type of wrath, not a human type of wrath like you and I have. It also comes from God and not from man, and that's another one of the reasons why we end up not being able to fully understand it. But it is directed toward all human ungodliness and unrighteousness, no exceptions. And so as you see in some of the scriptures I listed, those 28 scriptures, there are many, many different ways in which the wrath of God is, is, is carried out. Now, in 1741, the, the Great Awakening had just been going on for a few years. And Jonathan Edwards, who was a Puritan preacher, uh, preached a sermon that was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And you see a quotation there that you can look at, but Edwards was a very eloquent man, but frankly, he was one of the most boring preachers of his day 
because he read exclusively from a manuscript and he spoke in a monotone. Now, contrary, a counterbalance to that would have been George Whitfield, who had come from uh, England. England. Whitfield was not well educated. He was cross-eyed. He was ugly as a mud fence. And he spoke spontaneously and evangelistically. They became the closest of friends. And the two of these men were probably the primary movers of independence. Now, I say this to help you understand something about Jonathan Edwards. And he was not known to be melodramatic. But this statement that he makes in this sermon in 1741 illustrates the intensity of how he felt about God's wrath and the danger of rejecting God's offer of salvation. And here's what he said. All you that never passed under a great change of heart by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon your souls, all that were never born again and made new creatures and raised from being dead in sin, you are thus in the hands of an angry God. Tis nothing but His mere pleasure that keeps you from being this moment swallowed up in everlasting destruction. Now that's about as plain as you can get. Edwards likened sinner as a, a, an unbeliever as being one who was dangling on a mere spider's thread over the flames of hell. And it was only the mercy and grace of God that kept him from falling into eternal damnation and, and torment. So when we look at the contrast between common ordinary man and a righteous, sovereign, perfect God, we cannot see that God without including in it the awareness that sin is a repulsive thought to God to the extent that like an angry bull in, in, in a, a field snorting and bellowing and raging away, at the wolves that have come into the field to try to destroy him and his offspring. God is a God of love. He's a God of passion. He's a God of compassion. He's a God of justice. But he's also a God of wrath. And so, as a result, and then in verse chapter 2, Paul goes on and says, because of this fact, because man knows that God exists and man is aware that sin is a repulsion to God, he says then, therefore man is without excuse. There's no excuse. And you know what? You can say, I don't believe that. But it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Believing or not believing something makes no difference in the facts. And so as you and I, as followers of Christ, seek to live out our lives, we need to understand that a lot of the people that we know and a lot of the people we love, they're currently living under the wrath of God. And they don't even know it, and they don't even know why. And so this makes it even more imperative and more urgent that you and I be about the business of letting people know that there is a heaven, as they say, a heaven to gain and a hell to miss. See? Well, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. And uh, even though it's an unpleasant topic, I pray that you help us to understand the vehement, violent attitude that you have towards sin and toward ungodliness. That says something not only to the unbeliever, but it says something to us because it reminds us again of how seriously you take the idea that we live godly lives and that we live lives that are above reproach and that are free as best we can be from all kinds of sin and temptation. When temptations come our way, we need to trust the work and the power of your Holy Spirit to help us resist that and not fall for the trap. Amen. 
we need to understand that just because we are saved by grace through faith, that doesn't mean that we can go out and live the way we want, but rather that we must live the way we ought. And so I pray that you'll take your word this morning and touch our hearts with it and make us understand what a precarious position people without Christ are in today. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to uh, stand together and sing one of my favorite songs because this is the assurance and the confidence that you and I have as Christians, and that is it's on Christ, the solid rock that I stand, and all other ground is sinking sand. Okay? So Diane's going to come and lead us to the